Neve La Fortune was born in Port au Prince, Port au Prince. Yes, Paul Plus, yeah. Uh, and she is a councilwoman, as you all know, and she uh, came to Providence at the age of three and was ri raised on the south side of Providence and later in Washington Park. And her parents still live there. And uh, she went to Providence Public Schools, Pleasant View Elementary, Nathan Nathaniel Green Middle School, and Mount Pleasant High School, then got to a BA from Temple University in Communications and a Master's in Urban Education Policy from Brown University. And she's a council member, as I just mentioned to you. She represents the third ward, which is the area of Hope Street, right? It's Hope Village and uh, uh, Mount Hope, Collier, Collier Park, and Blackstone neighborhood. And she's the first Haitian American to hold elected office, office in the state of Rhode Island since 2017. Uh, during her first term, she served as the vice chair of the Special Committee on Education. And she is currently on the Committee for COVID Recovery and Resiliency and a member of the Committee on Claims and Pending Suits. That sounds really interesting. Mm, uh, it's a boring committee. <laughs> <laughs> All the lawsuits come through there. Yeah. <laughs> and the claims, yeah. <laughs> and she's on the Committee for the Charles Chaplin Memorial Award. And um, she's also a colleague because she work at Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as the Assistant Director of the Scholars Program Diversity Initiatives in the Office of the Dean of the College. And uh, before that, she was Assistant Director uh, uh, for the Center of Public Policy and Science, Technology, and Society at Drexel University. She, one of her great things that she champions is affordable housing, support for minorities and women-owned businesses, community development, prudent financial planning. That's a good one for our city. That's great. Uh, and uh, increasing transparency and community engagement in municipal affairs. And uh, she's on the board of directors of the Sophia Academy and We the Village and uh, on the advisory committee for the YMCA and Eastside Community Alliance. And of course, you live in Hope Village with your two children, and you're a runner. I love that, me too. And uh, so that's great. You'll probably run into each other. As, you, as many of you know, from the yard science, uh, Nirva was on the uh, ticket for the nomination for mayor for the Democratic nomination with Brett Smiley. Uh, got that nomination, but obviously, she's very engaged in city politics as a councilwoman and has thought a lot about the uh, future of our city and how to improve life in the city. And, and uh, we are very eager to hear from you. And I would say Councilwoman Nervola Fortuna is also a force to be reckoned with as we move forward. And there will be many more opportunities for uh, a mayoral election. And so I'm asking to help me please welcome Nervola Fortuna. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very uh, generous um, introduction. So I had shared earlier when I was walking in that because I was rushing to get to council meeting and I was coming from a student event, I had left my book bag somewhere. It's either at the event where someone will find it, but it's within our office space or inside my office um, with my laptop. So this is going to be more of a conversation and the presentation was supposed to be focused on education because that's my area. Um, I feel like I have a, a little bit of depth in there as a graduate of our public school system, as a parent, as well as someone who studied urban education policy. Um, I will say one um, point of correction, like clarification is that um, my position now is actually the assistant director of the Curricular Resource Center for Peer Advising here at Brown University. So um, I did grow up in Providence, and I do appreciate you saying that Brett got the nomination um, instead of saying she lost and she didn't win. <laughs> um, but I did not win the race this time. A dream deferred or a path deferred is not a dream or a path denied. Um, but it also taught many of us um, the inequities that exist in elections. Um, when we look at a city of a uh, over 100, a little over 180,000 people, and we see a race where you know, the person who won had to spend a significant amount, $1.6 million um, on a race like this. Um, my campaign was truly grassroots. Um, every dollar uh, we had to raise while working full time, while serving on council, while being a parent, while being engaged in a part of a community. And for most people of marginalized identities, um, just giving up their jobs and their lives to fully commit to running for office is not possible. And that's why we see an imbalance in government structures and the leaders and the people who are making decisions 
Um, and the reality is, is that when decisions are made, those that are impacted by those decisions, whether it's positively or adversely impact, are not always the people at the table. Um, and this is why we do need to change um, the structure of government, not only in the city of Providence and the state of Rhode Island, but throughout the nation. Um, you know, today on council, one of the things that was up for a vote, which I had to be there, was a Superman, um, the, um, not the Superman building, um, but the, it is a Superman building. I was thinking a Fane Tower just right now, which I voted against, was the Superman building, which is, you know, in many ways quite controversial um, for people who grew up in the city of Providence when Fleet Bank was there. Um, you know, I, as a kid, used to go in that building with my dad. I had a friend when he was a student uh, at um, Johnson & Wales. His first job in IT was inside that building, and it has sat dormant um, for many years. Um, and we also have seen the lack of investments, mainly the lack in, of investments in people, um, particularly in the downtown area. So with this particular vote, I was quite conflicted because one, we do know that we have an affordable housing crisis in the city of Providence and also the state um, where a majority of people are cost burdened, which means that they're paying over 30% of their income on housing. The average median income household is about $40,000 um, per year. Um, but we also have to have housing across all income spectrums um, for people who are unhoused, who have zero income, for people there are people who are unhoused who have income, actually. But there are people with zero income for people who are aging, um, for people who have families, um, for working um, communities, for professionals um, who just got out of college or mid-range um, folks. Um, but right now in the city of Providence, you cannot find a house in any neighborhood under to purchase under $230,000 per year. To afford a two-bedroom apartment, you would have to make about $70,000 per year. And remember, I said earlier that the median income household is about $40,000. So there is some real imbalance. So we have this construction where it would bring over 1,000 jobs into the city, um, which is going to create over 200 apartment um, um, housing units. Um, 30%, a third of those apartment units will be allocated to affordable housing. Um, but the affordable housing is about 80%, um, which is about working um, uh, workforce housing, I would say, more so. Um, but yet we still have a housing crisis. And so what I stated tonight at the meeting is that rather than us every time there's a new development or a new investment in the city of Providence that comes up and that's when we actually start talking about affordable housing, the priority should be us just prioritizing affordable housing. A few years ago, I introduced a residential TSA, which would require any developer who would like to um, receive some sort of tax stabilization agreement um, to, um, for residential um, housing development um, that they would have to allocate a certain percentage of their units to affordable housing. And the, the, the percentage would be based on, or the amount of the TSA, or the length, excuse me, of the TSA, um, would be based on the percentage of the units, or the, the AMI. Um, that has been sitting in the Finance Committee for two years now. Um, when Fane Tower proposed um, the construction of their building, and it was actually the ordinance was to change um, the zoning um, to, to allow the development to be much higher than what the land mass is zoned for. There's some environmental challenges, um, but also um, they did not um, propose any um, units of that construction or development would be allocated to affordable housing. I voted it down one. We're you know, changing the zoning policy, which I find to be problematic with such um, a massive um, development. Um, on a parcel of land that's on water, um, considering the poor um, infrastructure that the city has where on any given day, the whole downtown area can be flooded. I mean, that is a fact. Um, and also, we didn't make, he didn't do any market study to even see if um, 
the price range or that type of development is needed in that particular area. And so during that process, I had actually introduced an amendment to an ordinance that would require the developer to one, allocate a percentage of the units to affordable housing or um, um, pay into a, um, or and pay into a trust fund and um, allocate a percentage um, of funding towards uh, a trust fund to take care of that park, um, which costs the city millions of dollars, especially now that we have the beautiful bridge, which I love, and it's named after Michael Van Leeson, but it's very expensive for the city. Um, and my council colleagues, who some of them are talking about affordable housing tonight and abstained, voted it down. So for me, we have to prioritize affordable housing. The Superman building, it's not, that's, th that, that development, it's not affordable housing. It's more of an economic investment um, for the city of Providence in terms of bringing in jobs, in terms of bringing in more housing units, which we need altogether. Um, so I did support the first passage, but I did say that this is the time for them to relook at my um, residential TSA so that we can actually think about packages to present that focuses on affordable housing and affordable housing looking at the needs of the communities as well from people who have zero income to middle income from low income to middle income and also our aging population. So I do hope that's an approach that we take and I would like to pass that um, TSA before the end of the year and before my time ends on council on December 31st. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more and then I'll open it up to questions and we can have like a bit of a conversation. Um, but you know, one of the things that um, came up in uh, the email exchange is thinking about what are, you know, some of the challenges that the city of Providence is facing right now. So one, I talked um, brief extensively about the affordable housing crisis. Um, we also have a significant education um, crisis in the city of Providence. And although we don't talk about it as much, um, we do have an environmental crisis um, here. There's real environmental inequities, um, considering one, um, the, Allen's, um, lane, the Allen's Avenue corridor um, has um, one of the highest asthma or respiratory um, uh, rates um, in the nation. Um, again, you know, earlier I stated that on any given day the city can be completely flooded because of our poor um, um, septic um, um, infrastructure. Um, we've seen, oh, actually the city did flood. What am I saying? <laughs> it did flood um, a few months ago. And so there has to be some real investments into the city, but I think education should be one of the top priorities. We have um, a struggling um, and, uh, you know, frankly, a bit of a failing school system. Um, one, uh, our students, the, the per, 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 uh, per pupil expenditure is about $18,000 per year, which is pretty high across the nation. Um, majority of our students um, are um, students of color. Um, I believe six, over 60% of our students are Hispanic, over 15% are black. Um, so the majority are, are students of color. And um, about, I think I wanna say, average approximately 15% of our students uh, receive special education services. Um, we have a significant deficit in, teaching, in the teaching workforce um, and teachers who actually reflect the diversity of our students' population. And um, we don't have any real technical career opportunities or curriculum in our schools or a real dual language curriculum in our schools. Um, so I do believe that in order for our city to move forward, um, we need to invest in education um, so that we can create um, pathways for students to go to college or go into the workforce, but for our families to thrive. Um, our schools have been failing our kids for quite some time now. And if we had thriving and a thriving educational system, we would see more investments, less people would want to get, we wouldn't have to give those TSAs out like they're you know, candy <laughs> bars. Um, we would see more companies wanting to invest in the city of Providence. We live in a college town and yet the lack of jobs is kind of ridiculous. Um, the fact that we don't have enough labs in the city um, throughout the pandemic, we actually had to outsource 
um, and send um, everything to most of uh, you know everything to a lab in Massachusetts. Um, we don't have a biotech um, industry here or a real um, innovation industry, but we also have to have people who can go into these fields, people going to college and people wanting to stay in the city of Providence. And what I've heard from residents as well as business owners um, is that one, the schools are bad. If I want to start a family, I don't want to raise my children in Providence. Businesses are like, the schools are bad. I can't hire people from the public schools to work in my industry. And also, if I bring my business here, the middle person who's not make, who, you know, who's not rich, they can't afford $30,000 to send their kids to a private school. Um, even our medical system um, is struggling where I've heard from heads of departments of doctors who have a hard time one, attracting um, health professions here because of our school systems. Also, our reimbursement rates are horrible um, in comparison um, to Massachusetts as well as Connecticut. Um, and so there has to be real investments in education so that we can create more pathways and opportunities for our young people um, and also pathways into the workforce as well. So I don't want to talk too, too, too much. Um, so I want to open up the floor to answer any questions that you may have. And now I can say whatever. I don't have to be as you know, diplomatic because I'm out of council on December 31st for now. For now. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, have, I have a burning question yes, about the Superman building. Yes. Coming from a community where anything that was deemed abandoned as urban life, it was torn down. Mm -hmm. Why did they tear down the Superman building? How could a vacant building, just because you vacate it and they sit there, and it's just there until they figure out how they raise some city money to save it, how come that couldn't get torn down? <laughs> it's a historical site, yeah, I believe. So <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we will never tear you down. <laughs> um, um, I do believe it's um, on, like it's recognized as a um, historical site and um, our historical preservation. Um, oh gosh, I should know this because I like asked a whole bunch of, bunch of questions about this, about the architect. Um, I'm, being, I'm being a little facetious. I mean, yeah, facetious. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but I, yeah. I don't want to invoke the rage of our dear friend Brent who saves things. <laughs> but it really puzzled me growing up here and seeing that and knowing the people who wash those floors, yeah. how when there's a vacancy, it immediately trips over into being perceived initially as historic mm -hmm. versus, you know, urban um, flight of abandoned property. So I'm yes. just talking about how the optic comes in automatically <laughs> as something to be saved. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, think about um, the, the communities that were leveled just to build a brand new highway, um, you know, right, like literally across the river. Um, well, just northern. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, the advocacy um, to maintain that building, and I guess you know, when you think about the Superman building, it's right downtown. But you're you're absolutely right. Um, there's also inequities in what people choose to preserve, what communities they choose to invest in. Um, and that has been quite problematic in the city of Providence where we have seen um, communities completely forgotten about. I mean, on the south side, um, I, you know, when we first moved to America, we lived on Dexter, but on the, not the fancy side of Dexter. Now it's the fancy side. Back in the day, it wasn't the fancy side because my aunt used to live on Parade, um, but now the fancy side, but the other side of Cranston Street. And then from there, we lived on Dartmouth Avenue. And on the other side of Dartmouth, um, oh gosh, is it Harvard? Um, all these like street, um, there were all families there uh, for years. And they just started, I noticed, like doing some construction. But for years, even when I moved back home to Providence, um, I would go on runs and all these homes were boarded up. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to make any type of investments. And then you see um, so many mobilize, so many people mobilize. Um, people who are part of the historic, historical preservation communities, all those folks wanting to preserve this space, preserve this building, but when it comes to certain communities, if they want to do whatever they want, they will completely displace um, families and communities. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about buildings, yeah. and you know why Superman and all mm -hmm. that sort of thing, a skyscraper, mm -hmm. if we can call it a skyscraper, mm -hmm. you know anything that's over five stories, mm -hmm. let's just say, mm -hmm. is basically an uneconomic structure to begin with. You know, the if we look at uh, in other places, I believe it took a long time for it to become anywhere near a full occupancy yeah. of the Empire State Building. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They you know, they are a great symbol mm -hmm. and for so therefore they get some cultural importance. Mm -hmm. But as far as being an economic building mm -hmm. for a developer, it's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. It's only economic for the builder, mm -hmm. when stroke developer, mm -hmm. to sell it on to another guy, mm -hmm. to another guy, to another guy. Once it's rehabbed, the, yeah. Huh? Once it's rehabbed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history, the, from what I understand about the um, Superman building, it's quite unique in lots of ways mm -hmm. because it's built on pilings. Mm -hmm. Some of these pilings are wood. Some of them are concrete, mm -hmm. but in order to keep that building standing mm -hmm. and not tilting or falling down, mm -hmm. you have to maintain a certain water level under the building. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there are pumps there that are working 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And that means you then have to have another set of backup pumps, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of other things in it. Mm -hmm that you, we really need, to, it used to be, mm -hmm. that's where all the jewelry and all the gold mm -hmm. in one of the biggest industries in Providence mm -hmm. was kept. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, 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 it had a use, and mm -hmm. the problem is trying to, all buildings need to find a new use every 10 years, five years, whatever. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that building no one could quite figure out how to make keep it going. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, the idea that it used to be that you would have a, a whole corporation in a building that's gone. Well, yeah, and, and also COVID was, showed us none of our buildings. Yeah, we have to consider how these things can adapt to a new use. Yes, rather than saying tear the damn thing down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what they're trying to adapt this to is it's no longer going to be just um, for commercial space mm -hmm. as it was in the past. It's going to be residential and mixed use development. Um, so there's going to be resi mainly residential and then retail space um, as well. There's also been talks about perhaps having like um, some nonprofits in there, having some city offices in there mm -hmm. to make it closer to um, City Hall. Um, this, so when we're talking about you know the usage of some of these buildings, um, so the Superman building, Providence Place Mall, um, is another one where we've seen um, the fall of um, retail. Um, most people are purchasing you know their things online, right? They're shopping online, um, and a lot of the stores that were inside of the Providence Place Mall um, are gone. I worked in the Providence Place Mall. I worked at Filene's and also Brooks Brooks Store. Brooks not Brooks Brothers, the gadget store. Yeah. Oh. oh, Wilson. No, no Brooks something. Brookstone. Brook, yeah. Brookstone. Yeah. Brookstone. Brookstone. Yeah. Brookstone. I, I, I got that job just to sit on those chairs. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I remember when it first opened um, and all the stuff and people, I mean, Patriot players used to shop there. Yeah. Um, it has completely transformed. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so when we're talking about um, buildings now, um, downtown throughout the city, but mainly um, in these um, high commercial um, corridors, um, we do have to think about um, how they are being used and if they are flexible to be um, one shared with other um, companies. Um, so we're seeing more of these shared spaces. Um, the CIC is an example. Um, and also more mixed use development. And COVID also um, pushed that <laughs> a bit more. There's someone in the back, a gentleman, and then I'll go to you. Um, had their hand up for a while. Um, I, would, I would like to add to mm -hmm. the comments we just heard mm -hmm. right on the mark. You know, I think the issue is we have too many people mm -hmm. in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. that are involved in making major decisions 
for the decision that made historical. Mm. For an example, downtown Providence is underwater. Yep. There was a major flood in 1938 mm -hmm. where the water was mm -hmm. like you would not believe. Mm -hmm. And of course, what we've just heard, you know, attests to the fact that, well, what do you do when you're in a situation like that? We didn't plan to, to build on top of water, mm -hmm. but what do you do 150, 200 years later? Mm -hmm. Secondly, in terms of the schools, what concerns me is the health problems for the children. Mm -hmm. You know, on Allen's Avenue, there's a major rat problem that no one wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. And one of the principal reasons why so many Latinx children have asthma mm -hmm. or other respiratory problems, mm -hmm. that goes along with rats. Mm -hmm. So the rats are alive and well from Allen's Avenue mm -hmm. to the east, mm -hmm. all the way to Reservoir Avenue. Mm -hmm. And no one is addressing that. Because mm -hmm. even when I did social service work in South Providence, mm -hmm. I mean, they were out there at 12 o'clock noon time, mm -hmm. running all over the place. Mm -hmm. And even in the school buildings and in the playgrounds too as well. But no one wants to talk about that, which gets back to the schools mm -hmm. in terms of it being a historical. Mm -hmm. Schools were never designed mm -hmm. to achieve the goals that many of the educators are saying now. Mm -hmm. American schools only had two goals. Mm -hmm. One to make the children that attend the school citizens, mm -hmm. and secondly, mm -hmm. to get them to a particular point where they can get a job. Mm -hmm. Because many children in times past never completed their education. Yep. There was a factory job waiting for them, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. those factory jobs were all left Rhode Island, yeah. where the, these young people could make a decent salary. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I don't think that the school system can address that. And then the last thing I want to say, mm -hmm. and I'll get off my soapbox, is this. Mm -hmm. Why can't we say, we're a bedroom community of Boston, Massachusetts. People have been saying it. Well, yeah. you know, it needs to be said. Behind closed people. doors sometimes, but. but. <laughs> I think that our population, mm -hmm. all residents need to hear that because when I, I'm going to be on MBTA tra train tomorrow to go to Boston, I met uh, uh, construction workers. They told me, Harper, I have enough work for seven years, and they're going to Boston on the commuter train, mm -hmm. in their construction garden. When I get up to Boston, they're building like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. But we don't see it here. No. And I think that for the challenge for you, mm -hmm. you know, thank God that you did what you did for X number of years before the mayor. We never had anybody to attract something big. Mm -hmm. We need to have an Apple, a Apple uh, company here. Yep. Or some other major company yep. that can serve as an anchor. Maybe yeah. about 1,500, 2,000 jobs where people can make a decent wage. Mm -hmm. And then things slowly but surely will turn around. Yeah. But we don't have that. So what bothers me is, again, the ahistorical, and then people are coming up with these soft solutions when mm -hmm. the issues are much harder than what we think. Yes, so um, I actually have talked about being able to attract businesses here. Um, some of them have talked about the educational system. Um, being a problem. Um, so we don't have a real anchor company that's in the city of Providence that um, can hire a significant amount of folks. Um, we well, also you, wouldn't... You, you're, you're actually in. Mm -hmm. What is Brown University? Well, Brown is one of the largest employers. Yeah. The business. Yeah. But the education is the business, but then the people that the education system produces, unfortunately, do not stay. Right. Um, and, and I'm going to come to you. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the schools, they're not fit to provide an innovative education for our kids. Um, you know, uh, some of the schools, um, like going into even Hope High School, which was supposed to be the arts and theater school, um, they're now making some investments. Um, and it took years for us to even pass the bond. Um, for us to um, start the school construction. And for many, many years prior to that, there was a moratorium that prevented us from getting any reimbursements in school construction um, in the state of Rhode Island. So what ended up happening, the schools just got worse and worse and worse with rodents falling apart, um, falling apart, ceilings um, coming down. And the kids who are most, mostly impacted are kids of marginalized identities. Um, you know, the other issue, too, is that um, we do kind of need a high-speed trail um, um, here. Um, but there's the nimbyism, not in my backyard, um, 
um, and people don't want to build those trade tracks um, because they're like, it's going to obstruct my view, a bunch of things. Um, so I do think that there's a culture of this is the way things have been. Um, and we do need people to be a bit more flexible, but also thinking about um, how can we be flexible, but also make investments um, in um, our marginalized communities um, and people who have been historically um, or adversely impacted by policies. I mean, think about this neighborhood that we're in right now. I know people who live in Mount Hope who actually, family came, um, um, and you know, there's this beautiful, that funny, um, that's from funny, um, Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican um, documentary. If you haven't seen it, you need to see that. Um, but people from Cape Bird who came to work in, um, you know, the fishing um, industry, and many of them lived in Fox Point, uh, which was, was mainly a Cape Verdean community. Um, people lived on Benefit Street. Um, people were displaced um, when, um, you know, the policies um, where there were the historical homes and, you know, there are certain things that you can't do. If your house is deemed as historical, you can't, pay, you can't put vinyl siding, excuse me, on your house which is a cheaper way of maintaining your home, but if you're someone who's not rich, um, that becomes a problem. And, and people you know, were pushed out of their communities. Um, and then they were pushed to Lippitt Hill, um, then they leveled Lippitt Hill to build that plaza where um, Whole Foods is located, and then they were pushed further up um, the hill to the Mount Hope, and people are being displaced right now to, um, and, and Mount Hope. One, the rise of rent, the institutions like Brown have contributed to that. Um, in terms of you know, not building enough residential space to the students, students moving into the neighborhoods, driving the prices of rent where renters, which is not legal, but are charging per student um, rather than you know, per apartment. Um, so they're making a significant amount of money. So there are some real policy issues that exist, but we also have to think of innovative ways to move forward to make real environmental um, investments in the city to really create innovative school buildings so our kids can thrive and we're building beyond 21st century um, buildings and educational structures. Um, yes, do you have a question? So I just have two comments. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. One to the, uh, you know, why didn't we just tear down the school building? Full disclosure, I'm from across the bridge. I'm from Massachusetts, but okay. from a place that's similar impact is that mm -hmm. Because uh, I thought you were going to say East Providence, because that's across the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the issue being, especially in a city that's fraught, figuring out its infrastructure or having enough money for infrastructure, mm -hmm. it ends up being cheaper to keep it because if I have to decide it's my manpower for mm -hmm. the city that has to invest in to take it apart or pay a contractor to take it apart, if I have to choose that or snow plows mm -hmm. for the snowing season, I'm probably going to choose a set of lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I would caution about being really kind of ho about mm -hmm. having a, like a anchor industry, mm -hmm. mostly because similar to your TSA idea, I think there should be stipulations on a number of your employees has to be from yes. residing yes. in Providence. Yes. As someone who's had uh, mm -hmm. friends and chosen family, being mm -hmm. happy from San Francisco and LA, mm -hmm. thinking, that it's a great idea that like Google and everything is there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it near my place too, yeah. because we have bio industry stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, there isn't a pipeline to those kind of careers. So even though it's problems. Yeah. Um, we actually have this system called First Source that has been failing residents for ever. Um, and technically, you laughed. <laughs> The first source of like what's supposed to happen if it were to be effective is that if you are a Providence resident, you apply through first source, you put your information in. Companies that are here, especially those who have received any type of tax stabilization incentive, because that's one of the requirements um, that they have to first hire from first source, they should be looking at the pool of first source. But what ends up happening is that they say things like, oh, these people are not qualified enough. But yet we don't have, we haven't put in place the things to actually make people qualified. Like what are the training requirements that are required? How do we prepare people for these industries? We're not doing that work. So basically people have submitted application years for years and some people are like, I'm not doing it anymore. 
don't send me the first source because I've never been called. And they end up hiring from outside. I also think our universities should have a requirement, a requirement, requirement that a certain percentage um, of their um, of their employees um, live in um, the the city, in, in the surrounding community, and to also have opportunities for people to purchase their homes um, within the community. When I was working at Drexel University, John Fry, when he became president, and John Fry is um, he has an MBA. He's not a, and he's not perfect because he did gentrify um, university um, um, city <laughs> a bit, um, but. Um, there were some things that were done that did benefit like the community. But one of the things he did that I really appreciated is that Drexel created a partnership with the city of Philadelphia. They also um, allocated a certain, you know, some funding so that um, employees across the board, and I've seen employees who, people who are, um, um, are part of the custodial staff to administrators to clerks to um, faculty members um, who were able to purchase their homes um, in um, uh, the surrounding area and are walking to work, taking the bus, um, et cetera. And there was some funding for people who already had a house to make repairs um, in their home. Um, because Drexel was in a, surrounded this one community um, that people would call as the bottom. Um, um, it was, it was a food desert. Um, there were a lack of resources. And so I think that's something that um, when we think about the, um, oh my goodness, uh, the, in lieu of taxes, why is it, I, you know, I actually um, passed legislation on this. Um, Brown has a, uh, what's the end of the night? Brown is not paying their full taxes. What is it called again? Um, Darn it, it will come to me later. But anyway, um, a lot of our universities, including Brown, um, they're not paying full taxation. Um, and so right now, the pilot agreement, payment in lieu of taxes. I don't know why it took so long for me to get here, get up there. Um, and so one, um, it's going to need to be renegotiated. So the new mayor, that's something that they're gonna have to renegotiate. I do think that the university should pay be paying more taxes and also doing a better job in partnering and investing in the community. Um, but this is also an opportunity for to establish opportunities for people to be able to purchase their homes and stay in their homes in the city of Providence. And maybe there could be some sort of requirement that 20%, 30% of your employees have to be Providence residents or more. Um, I think that should be for Brown, um, Rhode Island Hospital, um, some of our major nonprofits um, that currently exist in um, the city and also have um, received some significant tax incentives. Now, I will say, Rhode Island Hospital, a lot of times we, you know, people talk about, um, you know, well, Rhode Island Hospital is not paying taxes. Rhode Island Hospital, the condition of that hospital is poor. I went into that emergency room. It is to be our trauma, our state's trauma center. Um, it is quite disheartening. Um, it's Southeast Mass's, I used to be in it's Southeast Mass's closest trauma ward. Wow. So when we get a gunshot victim, we're bringing it to Rhode Island Hospital. I was in there, um, my neighbor got in a car accident, and I, her daughter, who lives on our street, was out of town, so I went with her. Um, people were literally in the hallway, like people with blood on them were in the hallway. There weren't any rooms. And for emergency operations, it was right there. Um, there's like one large room. It is poor. It is poor. Um, the one thing that this pandemic, if anything, showed us besides the inequities that exist in our healthcare system, in our society that has existed forever, is we need to invest in public health care. Um, we need to invest in hospitals. We also need to invest in community health care centers. Um, I'm a big advocate because I, from the time I grad, um, came to America until I graduated from high school, my doctor's office was the Cranston Street Community Health Center um, on Cranston Street because I, I was undocumented and I didn't have insurance when I was young. Um, so we do need to um, invest in our health care um, infrastructure. Um, so yeah, so did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. oh, okay, good. <laughs> Yes. You said it's such a good proposal. I fully agree with uh, your idea of uh, making Brown and other 
places uh, have a percentage of people living in the city rather than in Barrington. I would increase the taxes uh, that we uh, yeah. earn and sell. I think that makes a lot of sense. I want to quickly come back to where we started mm -hmm. with your vote. Can mm -hmm. you, um, you know, I'm an architect and I, I love mm -hmm. that building. How <laughs> many more steps? Uh, I guess you voted, you said in favor. Yeah. I guess it, mm -hmm. was, it went through, others voted in favor. Yeah, 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 it went. They had a, a 11 um, um, eyes, so which mm -hmm. means if it passed for the How first time. How many more steps before it uh, One more. So it's first passage and then it needs a second passage. And then it can move forward. Forward with the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Wait a minute, I thought at the moment we were only dealing with the financing of it. That's the, the what, we, what we're voting, that's the only thing we were voting on. Um, yeah. And it's because this, they're receiving the funding from the city, they're receiving like the 30 million, which they have to repay back, yeah. um, which was a missing detail, which, and they're also obligated to complete the project, mm -hmm. right. which I think is big. Um, unlike Fane Tower, they didn't have a sunset clause, um, which was part of my proposal too. Um, so we, they passed this, um, I didn't vote for it, but they passed the ordinance and Fane still hasn't broken ground. Um, but he has all these incentives and he's also not obligated to allocate units to affordable housing. He doesn't put any money in. No, no. Um, so that's, that's the one thing that I, I I feel a little better about that. The project is going to go through. Um, it's not going to sit there. But I am. I'm. I'm. I'm conflicted. I left there. I'm thinking about it right now, um, because I did hear the many testimonies. People are struggling in our city. People are homeless. People are close to homelessness. Um, our subsidized housing um, um, developments. Um, there hasn't been enough build um, investments in there. Yes, um, we're going to do. We've just allocated some funds, and we're going to develop. Um, Jordan Barber um, too. Um, be, we also have to stop this whole, um, you know, the way that we, it's, it's like concentrated poverty. So when we think about affordable housing, it's always in um, the same neighborhoods. And we actually should look at the West Elmwood housing model, which is inclusionary zoning, um, where some units are subsidized and some people are um, paying full market rate, um, which part of my North Main Street proposal that I have been working on for years um, to really transform North Main Street. One, North Main Street, the R line is the most active transit line in the state of Rhode Island. They're doing the free um, bus pilot right now, so the R line is currently free um, to ride on. Um, I ride that bus um, in Boston. Thankfully, Brown, you know, if you're an employee, you get to ride the bus for free. I think the city of Providence should make that an option, and so should Rhode Island Hospital. Um, but I do think there's opportunity for mixed use development there where we have commercial space on the bottom. Um, I would love to see some studi art studios. Um, one of the things that um, you know, students have talked about, artists have talked about, is the lack of art studio and um, um, housing accommodations. Um, AS220's list, um, the housing list, um, wait list is probably like 20 years old now. Um, so there's opportunity to build. A more affordable housing, mixed use development opportunities for people to purchase their homes, their first home, maybe create like a series of townhouses. Um, I lived in Philly, my first house was a townhouse, which I paid um, $69,900 um, for my first house. I'll never forget that, $69,900. Um, so, you know, which I, I don't know where I would ever find a house that cheap. <laughs> um, but my first house was a row home. And my first house actually, I think, was bigger than my current house, um, <laughs> which is 1,080 square feet in Summit. Uh, but that's the only house that I could barely afford. Um, but, it's, um, but I do think that we should look at these high transit corridors. One, um, they're accessible to public transportation. Um, it takes you right into the center of the city. Um, they should have like um, opportunities for green space, um, supermarkets economic opportunities. Um, there should be um, some sort of incentive programs um, for women, uh, minority um, businesses. Um, there should be a DBA component, like a diversity um, um, equity component, um, um, but opportunities for people to have businesses along these corridors. Um, and it's also a little bit more uh, affordable um, as well. So that's a project that I started working on and even when I'm off council, I want to continue um, on that plan so that we can execute it. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's another question. Mm 
-hmm. What are you going to do when you're on council? I'm trying to figure that out. Right, okay. Yeah. Maybe, you know, I have like three boards that I really want to. I, the one thing I thought about is whatever I do, I want to be really intentional. Um, and the work um, has to be focused on the community. Um, so the three areas I've thought about is education, um, you know, um, economic opportunities um, for, you know, individuals from diverse community, but also a special focus on people of marginalized communities, and also thinking about people who were formerly incarcerated. Um, so from the time when I was in Mount, at Mount Pleasant High School, uh, I used to do this program at the training school. Um, and it was like this leadership program um, for young boys. Then when I went to Temple University, they had like the Sankofa project where we went to the state penitentiary every week to do a program. And then when I came back home in Providence, um, up until right before the pandemic, every semester, I would co-teach a class at um, the ACI um, with someone who was um, a faculty there through the CCRI program. Um, and you know, people share their experience about getting out of jail and not having any opportunities. Um, no one's willing to hire them. Um, you know, not having access to housing. Um, and gun violence um, has been a major issue that I lost my partner to gun violence 17 years ago. So um, I've been a strong advocate of passing um, stronger sense um, gun laws and safety um, laws here in the state of Rhode Island. So I do want to do some work around addressing the gun violence in the city of Providence. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm writing stuff yeah. down. We'll figure it out. And then one day maybe run for mayor again. Yeah, what? The, well, the guy who, the de facto mayor now, had to run for it. Yes, <laughs> yes, they, yes they did. And I think my daughter will appreciate it more because she'll be older and yeah. she won't really like care. So. Um, but the great thing about this whole opportunity is that uh, you know, I had posted that my daughter told me she wants to run for president one day, and she didn't tell me this, but like she proposed that her school have like um, a school governance, and um, she's in seventh grade, and so they created the structure. They went through an election, and she was elected vice president because um, the eighth grade, two eighth graders are president, um, two seventh graders are vice president, and the sixth graders um, is secretary. And um, the, after the election, a few days later, she was like, oh, by the way, uh, I'm vice president. <laughs> I'm like, this, this happened. She's like, you know, I was focused on your race. Uh, but I'm telling you now. So yeah. So and she did it in a grassroots way. Okay. She did. She did. And, and, um, and just finally, and I'm done. Um, one of the things I said at the end of, you know, in my um, speech um, on election night was that um, my concession speech, was that I do want to work on building better infrastructure for more women, particularly black women and single mothers, to be able to run for office. And I don't know if it's that's finding ways to connect people um, to resources, to raise funds um, and training opportunities, but that's something that I am committed to. So thank you all. <laughs> yes, I wanted to thank you. But before I do that, I uh, wanted to, uh, this is always the moment where I invite everyone to continue the conversation over wine and good food. And yes. <laughs> but I wanted to thank Councilwoman uh, Dr. Thank this was great. I admire your courage of taking on that city uh, that we all live in that has obviously a few problems to uh, solve. But you have such great ideas and the right approach. So I really hope you'll run again and, and next time. Thank you. Oh God, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you really so much. Nice to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.